A one-time professor at CU Boulder is a co-conspirator in Donald Trump's newest indictment, a conspiracy to overthrow the 2020 election. Prosecutors say both of them knew they had lost the election, so they're calling the former buffs former bluff. The state pulls the preschool play rug out from under families, yanking their universal pre-K funding at the last minute. We get that email telling us we are no longer uh, uh, able to do that unless we pay a substantial sum of money. Our imperfect emergency alerts, like the flash flood alerts we may see tonight, are based on one nightmarish night. And police telling protesters to stay on a sidewalk spiraled into search warrants, raids, arrests, what activists say was intimidation. That's tonight on Next. Former President Trump is now indicted for trying to overthrow the 2020 election with lies about voter fraud. And one of the co-conspirators from Trump's new indictment is the former CU professor who just got a new job. He's working for the Colorado Republican Party trying to change elections here. John Eastman is not charged with the crime. His attorney tells NBC News that Eastman is, in fact, co-conspirator number two, which is pretty obvious from reading the indictment. Eastman is the guy who drafted the legal plan to overthrow the election. The indictment says that when Vice President Mike Pence wouldn't go through with the plan, Trump told Pence, quote, you're too honest. Eastman is at risk of losing his law license in California these days, yet just yesterday, Eastman filed a lawsuit on behalf of the Colorado Republican Party trying to keep Colorado's unaffiliated voters out of GOP primaries. For some perspective on, on just how high the Colorado GOP is on John Eastman at the lowest point of his professional career, the state party says it doesn't have enough money to pay its own staff, but it's preparing to pay Eastman and another attorney a quarter million dollars for this lawsuit. Colorado Republicans are trying to throw out Proposition 108. That's the state approved law that voters liked in 2016. It lets unaffiliated voters cast a ballot in a party primary of their choice. Now, either party can opt out of this, but it takes 75% of party leadership to approve. That is a really high bar. So while Colorado Republicans pursue some rule changes this weekend to make that easier, they're also going to fight it out in court. The lawsuit claims the Democrats and unaffiliated voters are working together to defeat conservative candidates in GOP primaries. More centrist Republicans argue that kicking unaffiliated voters out of primaries will only ensure that the Colorado GOP's historic losing streak will worsen. The first year of taxpayer-funded full-day preschool in Colorado is about to begin. Now, all of a sudden, the state says it does not have enough money to cover full-day classes for some of the most needy families. Our Marshal Zellinger found that loophole buried in the 400-page bill, which is little help to families that are now scrambling for a place for their kids. It was one of the key points of Democratic Governor Jared Polis's inauguration speech. We're very excited about implementing free preschool for every family that wants it this coming fall. This was amazing for us as a family. Um, you know, fairly low income family. I'm a stay at home dad. My uh, wife's a probation officer. Alan Greening went through the application process for free full day preschool for his son Grant. We had been accepted for the placement that we had applied for which was uh, the free full day. His family met one of the five qualifying factors to receive more than just free half-day pre-K. The first factor, a household with a lower income. The other factors listed on the state universal pre-K website in late June were having an individualized education program, homelessness, dual language learner, or foster care. And then a week or so ago, we get an email uh, from UPK telling us that uh, there is no funding for free full day. This is the email that states, due to limited funding, not everyone who wants free full day preschool can get it. And today, the state's universal pre-K website looks different. Now it says to automatically qualify for more than free half day, you must be lower income and one of the four other factors. Why were the goalposts moved? from where they were when we made the application. According to a spokesman for the governor, the universal pre-K state law says if more families with qualifying factors apply than funding is available, priority is given to those with low income and another qualifying factor. Yeah, it's on page 175 of a 438 page bill that says subject to available appropriations. Allen's son was accepted for full day at the school he attended half day last year. And he can still go for full day if the family pays $536 a month. We drove past the school today and he, every time we pass it, he says, that's my school. And I sort of broke it to him gently that, uh, you know, his teachers might be different this year. We might 
have to go to another school, uh, to which he replied, I don't want to go to another school. I talked with Adams 12 where his school is, and it's possible that he could get into a half-day classroom. But although talking with Alan, it sounds like half-day at that school is full. This is where it's jumbled, Kyle, because you've got the state funding something that school districts have to handle placement also themselves to figure out do we have enough space or not. And there is space. It's just a matter of, like, how did people apply? And clearly, Alan and his son got picked where they wanted. And then you have this thing where it's like, just kidding, we don't have enough money to allow you to go where you wanted to for free. So you can either find another full day place that may be cheaper, or maybe we can shoehorn you into some half day program that you won't have to pay for. It's not, I know it's confusing. It, well, it's also just, I mean, it's, it's kind of cruel, especially to the kids. I mean, my, my preschooler found out her teacher today. She was so excited because you build up the whole anticipation because you can't just drop a kid in school. They're going to be terrified, you know, so families have been planning on this all year. There are possible ways to shake loose some extra funding, but this is not going to help families in the immediate term. No, Proposition EE from a few years ago, that was where cigarette and tobacco money taxes uh, went to fund this. And it was capped at a certain amount, like so many hundred million dollars. And there's going to be a ballot issue in November that asks, can we go above that and get all that tobacco tax money to go toward universal pre-K? But it's not going to help in this situation immediately. Marshall, thank you. The ACLU wants a federal investigation into the Colorado Springs Police Department. They say the Springs PD essentially got mad at some leftist activists, so they picked them up on minor charges so that then they could get access to their phones and social media messages. Steve Sager's along on this. Steve, this began when police shot and killed a man named Devon Bailey back in 2019. You may remember that case. And according to this lawsuit, some Springs PD officers were angry after a group of protesters marched outside the home of the officer who shot Bailey. That was back in 2020. Now, this lawsuit says the agency actually had a detective go undercover, posing as an activist while gathering information about other activists involved in this group for more than a year. Then things boiled over at another rally in 2021. Should we have to swap the shit out of these dudes and just throw flashbangs at everyone? Stingers. <laughs> oh, stingers. That's body camera video from the day of a housing march on July 31st, 2021. Also in that video, police appear to look through a dossier of protesters supposedly collected by the undercover detective. The ACLU is suing CSPD for arrests made at that protest. Police arrested two founders of the nonprofit Chinook Center for not allowing orders or not following orders to stay on the sidewalk. Police later got a search warrant for all of their private Facebook messages sent by that group. Then they arrested Jacqueline Armendariz Onsueta on felony assault charges for, uh, for dropping a bike in front of an officer who was running toward her. Police later seized her computers and cell phone under a search warrant. The ACLU says the cops didn't show justification for why those warrants were relevant to any investigation, and they call it intimidation. I value my integrity and ethics, and to be targeted for simply speaking the truth in the interest of protecting my community was one of the most painful experiences of my life. We think an investigation into the pattern and practice of what they've been doing ought to concern uh, everyone in Colorado and beyond, because if they can do this, to Jacqueline Armendaris, if they can do this to the organization like the Chinook Center, they can do it to anyone. What's also interesting, in this case, the detective who the lawsuit alleges went undercover inside that nonprofit actually registered to vote under her assumed identity. We found the voter record today, though it's marked inactive because mail was returned to the clerk's office. CSPD wouldn't comment on the pending litigation today, Kyle. But that's an interesting part of this. They pointed out in the lawsuit that that's a crime. The Secretary of State's office confirmed that today, that if you register under a false identity, it's a crime. Yeah, I, that, that was exactly what I was going to ask, which is, can, can, you, can you fake a voter registration because you're investigating? Yeah, hmm. it All was right. fascinating. It's, it's such an interesting story. It's more than just a few search warrants. Yeah, you don't want law enforcement to have enemies other than criminals, you know what I mean? Because then stuff can get out of hand. All right, Steve Saker, thank you. Anybody who thinks that elected officials are inflexible should really see some of the supreme contortions being done by Colorado's politicians to pat themselves on the back for keeping space command here. So it was a bit refreshing when a Democrat told us he gives a lot of the credit to a Republican. The announcement yesterday by President Biden reverses an order from pre former President Trump who wanted the base moved from Colorado to Alabama. Today, Democratic Senator Michael Bennett told us he gives much of the credit to former Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers, a Republican who spent years pushing back against the Trump decision.
It'd be hard to overstate the role that John Southers played here. It was just absolutely incredible. You know, his candor, his willingness to 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 uh, provide evidence about the political nature of President Trump's decision, I think, was really crucial here. Those of us who have been intimately involved in this for some, some time know just how political uh, the decision of the Trump administration and last week of the administration uh, to move it to uh, Huntsville, how political that was. And I was an eyewitness to that. Both Bennett and Southers reminded us that if Trump returns to office, he could just move Space Command back to Alabama, or another future president could do that. And even at this point, the Republican who leads the House Armed Services Committee is promising an investigation of the decision. The 1976 flood is still something that we look back at and to see have we made the changes that are needed for our community. 47 years after the deadliest flash flood in state history, technology is helping emergency responders learn new lessons to save more lives. A lifetime spent fighting for tribal rights brings a high honor for a Coloradan we think you should know. That's next. Monsoon season is here and these slow moving thunderstorms mean business. Take a look at this. Mark sent us this video. This is just south of Bertha. It uh, almost looks like curtains of rain coming through as well as incredibly gusty winds out there in Boulder. Scattered rain showers continuing to come down just through on the lightning tracker. Close to 1000 strikes across the entire state of Colorado within the past 15 minutes time. A lot of those up in the high country and now pushing across the I-25 corridor. That's where we really have the heaviest storms as we speak out toward Lyons about an hour ago. They received uh, two inches of rain in just 30 minutes time. Hence the reason that they're under a flash flood warning until about 815. Have a severe thunderstorm warning going in Weld County just south of Grover. They're picking up quarter size hail and back here in Denver, just some light rain continuing to push through. Have the flood watch going until about midnight tonight. That includes the Denver area and off to the eastern plains where once again we can see one to two inches of water come through all because of the monsoon finally setting up. Typically we start to see it about mid July and it's now the beginning of August and finally those southwesterly winds helping to usher back in some of that monsoon moisture coming our way from the Gulf. As we look at the future cast, storms pretty much moving out by 11 p.m. It should be a quiet start to the day, sunshine, and then here we go again. We'll do it all over with those storms firing up by about 2 o'clock, racing off to the eastern plains by 7 p.m., and then we'll quiet things down later tomorrow evening. Temperatures, though, on the cooler side. A bit of good news. Back to the low to mid-80s for us, again, with the storms after about 2, 3 o'clock. Still hot in southeastern Colorado. Lamar, Springfield, mid-90s for you with 60s and 70s up in the mountains. Looks like we might have a dry day on Friday and Saturday, and then mid-70s with more storms for the second half of the weekend. Thank you, Danielle. The emergency alerts that we get on days like today, warning of potential flash floods, were created out of one of Colorado's deadliest disasters. It was 47 years ago this week, the Big Thompson flooded, killed more than 140 people. That forever changed how Colorado prepares for natural disasters. Here's Mark Salinger. A room that's quiet now knows the sounds of chaos. We learn the most from chaotic events. Inside the Emergency Operations Center in Larimer County, Lori Hodges is ready for the worst. We were told by the National Weather Service in a briefing yesterday that today's storms will be more intense than yesterday's storms. To prepare for the threat of flooding today, the emergency management director remembers the lessons learned decades ago. The Big Thompson flood is actually the flood nationally that created the emergency alerts and warning systems nationally for flash flooding uh, because so many people died in that flood. Over 140 people died in the Big Thompson flood. July 31st, 1976. 144 people died as floods washed through the canyon west of Loveland. Well, the reason that there were so many deaths was there was really no way to alert a lot of the folks in the area. It doesn't take a lot of water to create a bad situation pretty quick. Kimberly Culp runs the Larimer County 911 program. When she sends an emergency alert warning people of flooding today, it can go out through cell phones, radios, landlines, and signs on the road. None of that was possible 47 years ago. Going back to 1976 as it relates to alerting people, we had zero tools. So the tools were more of people yelling, emergency personnel going to the area and doing the face-to-face -face trying to get people out of the way. Yet the challenge remains the same, reaching people in the middle of a canyon to warn them of danger. Because once you're in there, if you don't have radio coverage from a weather radio or cell coverage from a cell phone, we're not going to be able to reach you. Decades later, the lessons learned from one of the deadliest days in Colorado history are still 
saving lives. The 1976 flood is still something that we look back at and to see have we made the changes that are needed for our community. So in September of 2013, Colorado again saw widespread flooding with flash floods from Boulder to Colorado Springs. Nine people drowned that year. National Weather Service says the flooding in 2013, which was much more extensive than the Bid Thompson flood in 1976, but because there were better emergency alerts and more accurate warnings born from that 76 flood, many people got out of the area and Kyle, it was a far deadlier disaster. Mm -hmm. You think about, though, the crossover between a crackling radio in 1976 and an alert on your phone today is you still have to make a personal split-second judgment based on your previous knowledge. Yeah, and these are imperfect alerts. They aren't going to every single person who needs to get them. We saw that in the Marshall Fire, but the goal is to get them to as many people who need them as possible. Mark, thank you. People just don't know about us. They don't know that we are sovereign governments. America's best legal minds know John Echohawk is a giant of tribal law. Now this Colorado is being recognized for that work. That's next. You hear all the time about tribes defending their sovereignty. So let's talk about how that works. It works because of people like John Echo Hawk, who saw the need when he graduated law school in 1970 and helped found the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder. For a lifetime of work, this weekend he's being recognized as a civil rights pioneer. He sat down with our Mark Grady. I'm going to just come clap my hands in front of the cameras just to sync them all up. My name's John Echohawk. I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. I'm uh, an attorney and uh, serving as executive director of the Native American Rights Fund. What is the Native American Rights Fund? The Native American Rights Fund is the National Indian Legal Defense Fund in representing uh, tribes and native organizations, individuals across the country in cases of major significance. Uh, Tell me about the award, the recognition that you're getting this upcoming weekend. Well, it's the uh, Thurgood Marshall Award, uh, a very high achievement to, uh, you know, have the largest uh, uh, organization of uh, lawyers in the country uh, recognize the work of the Native American Rights Fund uh, over these years and uh, all the progress we've made in terms of uh, enforcing the civil rights of Indians. And it's just, uh, you know, another step forward in terms of uh, educating this country about us and our place in this society. You got the award, is it time to pack up, go home, work's done? Oh no, these cases go on and on. Uh, we get so many requests for assistance. These issues uh, continue all over the place and uh, we want to be there for Indian country and help them uh, assert their rights. Another landmark moment this weekend, the American Bar Association will get its first Native American president, Mary Smith, member of the Cherokee Nation. We will return with your feedback, which hopefully is about the news of the day and not just the fact that I have a vacation beer. Next. Feedback tonight from Bill. My TV's broken, so that's the reason why I just kind of paused there and stared at you blankly like an idiot. Uh, Bill writes, holy crap, somebody actually made me care about these latest Trump indictments. Bravo, thought the whole thing was tedious and repetitive since that's all that cable news and my boomer parents talk about, but the local angle with John Eastman intrigues me. It's interesting, Bill writes. It, it is interesting. John Eastman is one of the central figures in Colorado Republican politics today, and as of this afternoon, he's co-conspirator number two. Mike writes in to say, am I seeing things or is Steve Steger clean shaven and you have a beard? Mike, he donated it to me, which is a really nice thing to do, but he's a great friend. A text from somebody who says, Kyle, you look like a 12-year-old with a beard. Again, we'll tell you when the boss tells me to get rid of it.